As I walked across the stage of Madison Square Garden, I thought the world was my oyster. I held a blank piece of paper in my hand, showed my parents my pretend diploma. I thought the world was my oyster. I was student council president, I had a radio show, things were going well. I definitely didn't consider myself a feminist. So much so that in my senior year of college at Stern College for Women, there was a box in the library on the floor of used books on sale for a quarter, including prominently on the top, Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique. And I thought, I don't need this. The world's my oyster. I could do whatever I want. I didn't make the purchase. I didn't splurge the quarter. Shortly after, I could say it take months, it probably took a few weeks, I realized the world was not my oyster. <laughs> and I was in for a rude awakening. Nonetheless, I, I wanted to jump in as a Jewish citizen. I joined my synagogue. I paid my dues. I joined the development committee because no one else wanted to be on the development committee. And it provided me with the opportunity to go ahead and run events. And with the events came a little bit of the kickback, which then qualified as development committee. We had a number of great events, fun, made a little bit of money. And then at one point, we had a, one that failed. It was an abysmal failure. And we were having a post-mortem to try and understand why it failed. And it was an all-women's event. And I had suggested perhaps it failed because a man was making all the announcements. It was off-brand, it was awkward, it just it didn't work. And I said, why don't we have a woman make the announcements next time and maybe for other events too, why not? And they said, Sharon, women can't make announcements in our synagogue. And I said, why can't? I'm looking at former presidents of this synagogue, uh, or almost presidents, okay. I thought, why can't women make announcements in the synagogue? And I asked, why can't women make announcements in the synagogue? And there was no answer. Was it the rabbi? Was it the administrator? Was it halacha? Was it Jewish law? Was why? No answers. So my new icebreaker conversation that year, because we have icebreaker conversations at Shabbat meals all the time, what's your name? What do you do? Where are you from? And did you know that our synagogue has a policy? And how do you feel about that? <laughs> My roommates loved it. <laughs> Fast forward a few months, I was trying to pass the baton. I, I was in graduate school and working. I, I just needed someone else to fight this fight for me. And no one was picking up the baton, but then, and it's pre before Upstart or what have you, in terms of Jewish innovation, our synagogue in Washington Heights decided to have a who's gonna be the next announcer contest. Kind of like American Idol, only so much cooler. <laughs> Maybe you could be the one to let everyone know who sponsored Kiddush that week. So I applied because the opportunity was there for me on a silver platter. I applied, I called, I emailed. No one got back to me. I used every method of communication because back in that day we did not have WhatsApp and Instagram and all those things. So no one got back to me. And then there was this final announcement on the bulletin board that said last call. And so I posted publicly, I'm confused. I called, I emailed, no one's getting back to me, is it because I'm a woman? 10 minutes later, in all caps, yes, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Thus started my 5 a.m. manifesto and months of deliberations and conversations and strategy. But I walked into a bookstore, because that's the thing that we used to do back then, and I perused the aisles, and I come across my old friend, Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique and I paid full retail. <laughs> I bought it because I wanted to appreciate how far we've come, to see her reality and how different it was from my reality and to celebrate that. But more importantly, I wanted to try to understand why she was so successful. Was it her method? Was it her content? Was it how she delivered her content? How did she start a movement or keep the movement going in such a significant way? And I wanted to think of that totally separate from Orthodox Judaism. But then she went ahead and mentioned a blessing that most Orthodox men say every day, thanking God for having not made them a woman. And it hit home. And while this was happening, what I haven't shared with you is that my roommates and some of my other friends had been working on starting what did, there was no name for it. It was a very controversial type of service, a prayer service, which today we call a partnership minion. And it's an Orthodox service which allows women to lead certain parts of the services. 
and I thought it was totally forbidden. And I had already planned, I wasn't going to go. I, I was going to go out of town, and I was going to say, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm out of town, I'm going to miss your thing, but you guys are great, you're awesome. <laughs> um, but with all this happening, I realized that perhaps it was time to consider it. And I spent time learning the different Jewish laws that related to this and realized that there's little to no ground for, for me, certainly, not to, to approve of this. I decided not only was I going to go, but I wanted to make sure that this, that this was successful. So I asked my roommates, how's it going? How's the planning? They couldn't find anyone to come for the first, to lead the first services. They couldn't find a woman who would step up to the plate. So they were going to ship in someone from the Upper West Side who had a beautiful voice, and she was going to lead services. And I said, this needs to happen, and it needs to be a need within the community, and someone from the community needs to lead it. And I said, and, and basically I said, I'm going to be your backup, and you keep looking. Obviously, <laughs> when you say you're the backup, you're on deck. And now she had time to go to Ikea and find a makeshift mechitza and bima for this minion. I was so nervous. I practiced. I practiced. I had been to services for decades, but I had always been in the passenger seat. I had never been in the driver's seat. I didn't know what that felt like or looked like. And it was a snowy night in a packed living room. It was the living room was packed, the kitchen was packed, the hallway was packed. And I walked up to our makeshift bima, and I opened my mouth to begin services. And I realized I can't hear my voice. And I freaked out a little bit. I thought, is it because my, my voice is, is my mouth dry or what's going on? And I just, I, I, I was a little nervous, like what, what is happening here? And then I realized I'm singing, but so is everyone else. And there was one call of tefillah. There was one voice of prayer all together. And as a tear fell down my, my cheek, I realized that's what Betty Friedan did. It wasn't her voice. It was the voice of many. It was the voice of everyone in the room. It wasn't until after this incredible transformative moment that I had not anticipated for me that I realized I may lose my job. <laughs> You could be fired for a lot less in the Orthodox community. This was very controversial. I turned out in the end, I called, and I said, listen, I did this thing. It's called, I don't know what, but I led services. And um, I ended up not losing either of my very mainstream Orthodox jobs. But what I did do was I took a risk. And it wasn't for me. I didn't think I would get anything out of it. I just felt passionately that it had to happen. And it wasn't until after that I, I thought about the consequences or the possible consequences. And many of us take risks for others. And that's a good thing. We're people that said, Nasa Venishma. We're people that stood at Sinai and said, we will do and then we will listen. What I, what I didn't realize and what I didn't fully appreciate is that when we put ourselves out there for others, when we go with our gut and just do what's right, it will have an everlasting change on us as well.